G'day ladies and gentlemen, the Buttsman here, hope you're doing well and welcome to a new episode in the bunker of the Butterfield Effect. If you want to look after the good people of the Butterfield Effect, which is basically me and producer Connor, anyway, if you want to look after us uh, and help us out, because at the moment everything seems to be getting demonetized, check out our Patreon, there's lots of perks there, so go and check out the link in the description below and the top comment, click on the Patreon and, uh, I don't know, become part of, help us out. We're, we're poor, lonely people. Ladies and gentlemen, today's guest is a very good friend of mine. I've got to know him over the past couple of years, but also he's someone I used to watch before I got involved in the YouTube game. He's a former NRL player. He is a flying winger. He's bring terms like the goosey to the Australian vernacular. Ladies and gentlemen, the former Brisbane Bronco, the former New Zealand Warrior, and the former St. George Illawarra Dragon. Please mate, welcome to the show, someone who you'll really enjoy. It's Denon Kemp, the bloke from Bloke in a Bar. Danan, Dead Camp, how are you, mate? What's happening? <laughs> I'm, I'm very, very good, mate. Uh, good to see your beautiful beard in this, this troubling times. The masculine energy is just giving me a lot of testosterone. Good. So I appreciate I'm, it. I'm glad to hear that. Um, as, <laughs> as we discussed before the, uh, before the podcast, we found that we could actually add virtual backgrounds to here with the, with the Zoom app. And I, I started... Is yours off- virtual? Yeah, mine's actually, it's actually not behind me, nor is this bloke, uh, unfortunately. Oh, this is my wallpaper. This is oh. my wallpaper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this yeah. is what I've got at home. <laughs> this is what I wish I had. Um, that is confronting, uh, to say it's, the very it, least. I tell you what, it tests the manhood every day if you woke up to that. Surely yeah. the body's got to be releasing more testosterone if it's woken up to that. <laughs> I, I think that that is the thing. Like if you're in prison, you see they're all jacked. Well, at least you do. Yeah. Maybe that's just American prisons. I'm not too sure if that's something that happens across the globe. Or is it just like well, the, the American prisons where you just see the big jack dudes everywhere? Um, uh, to be honest, I don't have much of a, uh, a background in prisons. So I can't okay. uh, give you a... Uh, no, no, but yeah, you know what? I, I would love to actually look into that because there is so many males around. I wonder mm-hmm. if it does increase testosterone um, because of the fact that, you know, you're sort of, it's like, you know, women, when they are around each other, they sometimes like menstruate on the same cycle and everything. They like sync that. up their periods. Yeah. 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 And they sync up their mood swings, which is also fantastic. Terrifying. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, you're not allowed to say that these days. That doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. You can, you can say it on my channel. You can say whatever the fuck. <laughs> <you want. laughs> um, but no, yeah, it'd be interesting. Actually, it'd be very interesting. I mean, uh, all jokes aside, aside from the fact that you'd get dominated by other men. Um, yeah. It'd be interesting to know. It would be scary. That's something that I've always been terrified of is going to prison. And I, I don't know why. I don't know if it's because like I'm a big dude that other big dudes would try and like win one over <laughs> yes. me. Like that's yes. like you walk in and they go, oh, who's this bloke with a beard? Like let's try and you know, corner him yeah. in the washroom or something. And that, that scares me to be honest. Like I've tried to stay away from things that are illegal over in the past and in my, <laughs> in my life. But, you know, I think there's times we always, we all, we all end up, in some situation where we do something a bit iffy and we go, oh fuck, this could end badly, um, and that oh. that that scares me. But absolutely, and the thing I think I try to say um, to people is like, it doesn't matter how tough you are. People in prison are crazy. Do you yeah. know what I mean? You could be the best MMA fight. Like I remember there was an interview with Mike Tyson, and he was saying like people were like throwing shit in that, and it's like that's Mike Tyson. Like if there is one alpha male in the world, it's Mike Tyson, and he was saying like if you've got nothing to lose, you're the scariest bloke in the room. So yeah. you don't give a fuck what's going on. Whereas like you could be Mike Tyson, literally be wigging out. Cause you're like, I've got something to lose here. They say that they're the ones that are the, the most terrifying in prison is the ones that are the nutbags, the crazies, the ones who, yeah. you know, logic and fear doesn't even exist. It all just comes down to they'll do whatever the fuck they need to do to survive. And I mean, we were recently doing a, 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 docu- a documentary uh, at a jail. Uh, it was a ghost hunt. It's an old, old, old jail up, uh, up here in Newcastle called Maitland Jail. Been open for a long time. And one of the uh, former prisoners was Ivan Malat, the backpacker murderer who oh. drove up and down, um, yeah, friend of the show, uh, up and down <laughs> the New South Wales coast and, and killed a lot of people. And he ha- his um, cell was different to everybody else's because in his cell, he had like a, a grate up because he kept throwing shit and piss at all the guards and other cellmates and all that type of stuff. And you just like, imagine living across the way from Ivan Malat. But I remember when I went there, I was in high school the first time I went to this jail because they have like, you know, history tours and all that shit. And they said that the female uh, 
shower block was directly across from Ivan Milat's cell. So if he got up on his tippy toes, he could see straight into the feet. Like who's, who, what logistic fuck, logistical fuckwit gave that decision or made that decision? It's a fucking absolute, <laughs> it's a mess. This like, 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 they're looking at the names. They're like, all right, uh, guys in for a bit of weed, guys in, done, done a bit of racking his time. Ivan Milat, yeah, probably throw him just there. Should be sweet. Yeah. Who should we let see the titties? Ivan. Yeah. 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 He's I just mean, a guy. That weed dealer. That weed dealer is borderlining rapist. So we'll just put the Ivan guy on there. What they should have had Ivan looking at was that. <laughs> oh, yeah, in his, they should have had up close and personal in his cell with him at all times. Have you followed this dude or, or seen what this whole meme is about? I, I uh, Yeah, I did not delve into the rabbit hole of a naked large black man. <laughs> okay, not. well... Let's do it right now because <laughs> I, <laughs> <That's it. laughs> I wanted to, I've been looking at it. I've been trying to find the meme and the, the problem with <laughs> Googling this meme is like, what do you Google to find that black, large black naked man sitting on bed? So, <laughs> and it already black. came up as you, like, you know how it auto feels cause you've already searched it before. <laughs> <laughs> Where is it? All right. Let me move that. Okay. It's all just porn sites at the moment. So that's terrifying. Um, yep. fuck, help me out here, Kempi. Um, um, large dominant alpha male. Oh, male. there he is. I hope you can't see what I'm Googling right here. Cause <laughs> no, I meme. Okay. This should be it. This should be it. Huge penis. Coronavirus. <laughs> Frank photo <laughs> wants meme to help. This is TMZ. Okay. This, this is all right. Incredible. Incredible. Uh, <laughs> So this guy, the well-endowed man from the coronavirus prank text is popping up on all kinds of, uh, all kinds of gear. But now, but now since he's now dead, the guy who snapped the pic wants some dough to get in the right hand. So he wants some cash. So some guy, oh, Pantheon, Pantheon, Pantheon. No, no, that's the guy who took it. Wood. He's a gay porn star called Wood. <laughs> oh wow you could have honestly if there was like a, a name generator it probably would have come up with that blackwood i don't know but that is terrifying <laughs> and this dude's doing the runs and i've seen a few different ones where it's like he's people are doing puzzles with this dude and that's what they, they haven't no done the dick part. it's great it's a great part of the internet and and you're someone who uses the internet just about as much as me and i remember when i was a, a younger fellow i saw a bloke in a bar just starting out and um, it was it was really taken strides. One of the first uh, people with a background in rugby league doing anything to, uh, that has anything to do with podcasting, uh, online content, and all that type of stuff. What's happening with bloke on the bar at the moment? I know that obviously with Corona at the moment, the actual bar is not uh, operating. But what's happening in your world, uh, mate? It's uh, yeah, it's it's been crazy. So we we launched a beer like probably three weeks ago, around one of the NRL season, um, and it was insane. Like you, we we just incredibly humbling. You wouldn't experience it, you know, when you when you see these like thousands of people engaging in your content, but then also actually spending their hard earned money. It's almost a bit intimidating. Like you're almost a bit taken back by it because you're like these many people actually like what I do. This is yeah. fucking crazy. Um, so yeah, you, you just I guess you got to push through that kind of anxiety uh, part of it. But um, yeah, with the coronavirus, it's it's been a bit strange because people are still sitting at home doing nothing. Like, so they're actually drinking more piss than they were before, um, which is, I guess, good as a beer company. But um, from our perspective, because we're so tightly connected to footy, our, our kind of goal over the next week or two is to, all of our profits for the next two weeks will go to Rugby League, to, to the Rugby League's Players Association. And we'll right. partner with them to help um, players that may be struggling because they have such a massive pay cut. Because a lot of people don't realise is that most players aren't on a million dollars. You know, they're, they're, there's players on, you know, 100K a year, which sounds like a lot of money, but A, it's for a very small period. But also B, if you're, pay, if you're cut immediately 75% of that, you're sitting on 30K a year as a, as a person with a family. It's actually pretty hard to, to survive. Um, and also because your industry doesn't get the same kind of, uh, like, for example, the, the, I'm, I'm pretty sure Job Seeker at this stage doesn't apply to NRL. It might. Um, but yeah, so it actually can really affect the boys. So our hope is to make sure that these younger boys on the smaller contracts, if they're struggling, they can't pay rent or, or maybe it's to pay for the, the, a course they want to do. Um, yeah, we're hoping to do this. So that's our focus kind of like 
we don't want to be seen as someone doing really, uh, really well while everyone else is struggling, especially when the reason why we're doing really well is because of the rugby league community and because of the footy boys and that. So, yeah, that's, that's a, that's a real noble story. thing to do, mate. That's a really noble thing to do. And, and I was talking about this with my old man who, who for those who are watching the show, haven't uh, seen much of my stuff, used to play rugby league for the Knights uh, back in the day. And the glory you know, days back in the days where you were getting paid 60 grand a year, but you know, 75% of your wage. And I think early on they were talking 79 or 85%. That is a lot of money. And even if you're making a million dollars a season, like some players are, man, you've got not only is most of that tax anyway, you earn over $150,000 a year. I think 50 cents on the dollar goes on tax. But the, the, the fact is that if you're making that type of cash, you're also paying off, uh, you know, a more expensive mortgage. You're paying off car loans. You might have a boat, all that type of shit that people with cash buy. And all of a sudden, if it gets dropped, you know, if you've got a three-year contract and a four-year contract or someone like Caelan Ponga who's making 600 and a half, I don't know, half a dozen the other, making a million, I don't know how much Caelan Ponga makes, but it's close to a million, right? Uh, maybe 850. If he gets told tomorrow, listen, you're going to only make $100,000, well, most of that goes on bills, if not yep. close to most of it. So to have that news is terrifying, and particularly if you can't plan for it. Like if you get injured, you do your ACL, you're out for 12 months, whatever it is, you know, you still, you've got income protection or you're still on contract, you know, you can still make money. Now you're just fucked. Oh, absolutely. And the irony is, is the same people go, oh, they're on a million bucks or whatever, are the same people that would have said, don't be stupid with your money, invest in real estate, invest in, you know, buy things and that. So when they retire that they have assets. So like if they're doing what most people tell them to do, which is be smart with their money, they actually are in a worse off situation than a young guy that's got heaps of cash coming in and he's just spending it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, I understand people's pain right now. Like sometimes they're, they're actually just expressing it cause they're in pain themselves. Like he's on a million bucks and it's really just a, an outlet of their own stress. So I understand that side of things. I get it. But at the same time, um, yeah, like a lot of people don't understand if you are earning a lot of money, most of those guys have, are taking that money to invest it, understanding that that is not going to be coming in for the rest of their life. And if they don't have assets when they retire, they're essentially just sitting there going, I'm, I'm stuffed. I've got a lifestyle that I'm used to. Can't afford to pay for it. Um, so, yeah, mate, it, it's absolutely, especially like there actually might be some guys that are on a million dollars that are going to get hit harder yeah. than the guys on 80K or 100K because of all the, the outlays that they have um, currently. So, yeah, mate, I'm, I'm totally with you. It's, um, again, it's not a woe is me, that's for sure. There's fucking plenty of people doing worse. But it is fair to kind of sit back and go, all right, what is the reality of the situation? Not like, oh, they've got a million dollars because the media fucking said they did. You know, what's the reality of the way they're living kind of thing? But also to touch on what you said before, this is a short period of time, you know. Mm. And for a lot of young people, and I'm not sure what the NRL is doing at the moment as far as education and things like that, but if you're a young person who is in rep squads and all those type of things, Harold Matz, all that shit back in when you're a younger person, maybe 15, 16, you know, you're committing three, four days a week to traveling, going to training, and then you're on the weekend, you're away doing that. Maybe you don't have the amount of time you have, you, a normal person your age has to uh, contribute to education or put into thinking about what you want to do. And a lot of these people who we're talking about here are, they're winners. They're people that are just so, so dedicated and they want to, they want to win at what they're trying to do. And that is, in this case is rugby league uh, or, or whether it's, soccer or rugby union, whatever, they're all in the same boat. You know, they dedicate their times to being as good as they possibly can. You don't have the same amount of time to go to uni as someone else your, your age uh, has. So to then be told that, okay, this, this window of 11 years has just been cut to 10 years, you're missing out on a big chunk of what could be super, what could be uh, paid off, you know, 30% of your, 20% of your home loan. It's a big step back for a lot of people. Oh, absolutely, mate. Absolutely. I think if you, again, I, I just think that a lot of people, it's not because they're, they're bad people when they're bagging their boys. They just don't have the information. They don't actually understand that, for example, you know, most players, let's say, that, like it's really good at the moment, but let's say on, on an average, every NRL player is on 300K. Let's just assume that amount. Now, if you take that 300K and you span it out over a 40-year career or a 50-year career, it actually turns into... Um, you know, fuck all pretty much. Yep. The, the official term is fuck all. Yep. Um, and so the irony with that is, is so they're actually 
to get to play in a role from basically when they were five to 17, they were working towards that goal. And yet a doctor from out of school for seven years only has to work seven years essentially to get to that dream. And then for the rest of his life, he just keeps going up and up and up. And so it's actually an unfair trade. I know it sounds bizarre. I fucking know. And don't get me wrong. I'm not sitting here saying like, oh, woe is me. I got to play NRL. Fuck, no way. But what I'm saying is when you actually look at the numbers and the amount of time it has been uh, put in to actually achieve what they've achieved, they're actually getting ripped off like over a lifetime um, you know, period. Again, this is not me saying like they, they really are, are being ripped off. They are off, being yeah. ripped off. Particularly when you look at the NRL and they're, they're making, you know, these billion dollar TV deals a couple of years ago. and now, you know, there's some people who are making their first grade debut or they've been in first grade as just sort of someone coming off the bench for a couple of years now and they're only making a hundred grand. Considering that like, people don't understand what a billion dollars is, it is a lot of money. It is so much money, and the NRL are making an absolute shit ton. Even things like State of Origin, the amount of money that they make from that oh. to only play that pay the players, what is it, a couple of. 10, 20, 30K. 30K? 30K, yeah. Fuck all. That is absolute fucking nothing. And that is one of the worst things about, but it's not just the NRL, it's the UFC as well and all these people. They don't pay their people enough. And I understand yeah. that because they're, they're the, what else are you going to do? You know, yeah. they're the powers that be. What else are you going to do? But it is, it is not fair. And that's where the Players Association and unions come into uh, they really need to have them there in those situations to make sure that because unfortunately with rugby league and I know this from playing uh, in lower grades for, for for x amount of years was a lot of people they're they're not overly intelligent. If you're going to run head first <laughs> into people, they are not overly yeah. intelligent, <laughs> particularly in the yes. forwards. I mean, you know, <laughs> as a front <laughs> rower. Uh, an ex-front row. I think you're being you're being generous by saying yeah. they're not overly intelligent. You're being generous. There is a lot of dumb cunts that play rugby league. And <laughs> exactly. That's that was, just the way that was it is. a fair statement. That's just the way it is. I'm, that's that's what this podcast is going to be called. The dumb cunts <laughs> that play rugby league. What, what do you think? I mean, let's go back a couple of weeks when it was the first round of the NRL in Australia. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts on the current game, where it is at the moment? Because I've got my thoughts and yep. I, I'm going to share them with you in a moment, but I want to hear what you think about... Uh, everything that's happening in the world of uh, rugby league at the moment. Um, I think it's, I think it's great. I think I, I love it to be honest. I think so for example, from a, from a health perspective, um, we essentially made record profits last year as in the NRL did the year before that surplus again um, from 2012, they were at about $180 million revenue a year. Now they're at about $550 million revenue a year. Um, so from a business perspective, that's actually really encouraging. Um, in, I think I'm pretty sure that participation was actually up last year, but I think they might be conflating the women can participate, like they're using the women's numbers that that's, that's increasing obviously. And they're putting that into the guys. So I don't know how accurate that was. Um, so from a business perspective, I think it's decent, it's solid, but I think they need to push more towards digital. They have like, I know it's a big ship. It's like anything, a big ship. They take fucking forever to turn like, you know, we've been saying for like 10 years, the internet's the way and they're only kind of starting to see it now. Um, from a games perspective, I think it's incredible at the moment. Like the, what we're seeing these, these guys do uh, talent-wise, size-wise, um, absolutely incredible. I, I love it. I think the only thing that we could probably do as a game better is maybe have the clubs so that... Uh, like, it's easy to sit here and say, have the clubs run better. But I don't know the, ins, the working outs of clubs, but... Too many clubs are making um, a loss financially. If we can bring that up to at least breaking even or just a small loss, I think that would help the game heaps. But other than, and then there is the issue of uh, participation in the youth. You know, obviously soccer is taken over in that like by a mile, but doesn't mean it's going to convert into people playing A League. Uh, but as a game as a whole, I'm, I judge it on am I looking forward to footy every week? Is it something I'm excited for? If, if, if it ticks those two boxes, I would say I'm, I'm loving the game right now. Um, now, obviously, there are things that we can improve on, um, like, you know, the speed of the game and not, not so many breaks. But other than that, I fucking love it. And I, th I think, not to give myself a rap, but um, the good old not to give myself a rap and then you give Go yourself ahead. a rap. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but, like, I do think that Bloke in a Bar externally from me has really shown that we have characters in our game and I'm really, I'm really glad that over the last 24 months, or probably like 16 months, we've really been able to see essentially what it's like in the locker room. These boys that are, they're actually just fucking 
bunch of fuckwits having a bit yeah. of fun. That's all they are, really. So that's um, what I that's what I was going to touch on, and I think that it was very interesting that you brought that up because you are doing what the NRL should be doing, and what clubs mm-hmm. should be doing. If clubs want to be more profitable, if the NRL wants to be more profitable and take over the Australian landscape uh, from the other codes. What they are missing is they're missing uh, characters in clubs. There's no, why, why is there, and you, you've played NRL, maybe you could answer this question. Why is there no Conor McGregor in the NRL? Like oh, that because man. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you why. You know what? I'll tell you why. It's because, um, and apologies for interrupting you. It's because there is this, this battle between the coaches wanting to keep everyone like in line, like the army. <laughs> Fucking don't pull your head out, pull your head in. It's about the wins. And then there's the business side and it's constantly clashing. Sure. Um, you know, it's constantly like, and on top of that, it's Australian culture hurts a bit as well. Obviously the tall poppy syndrome, everything like that. Um, but I do think I totally agree with you. Why isn't there like, for example, the uh, hectic cheese, you know, went viral. Everyone loves cheese. Everyone Love loves that. the cheese. There's still no merchandise for the cheese. Like, can, you, can, you explain, can you explain the cheese for everybody who may not be 100%? Well, it's like this. Well, okay, so the cheese is essentially... We'll flash up a photo. It, yeah, yeah, we're going to get a photo. Up. Oh, you'll put one up in the thing? Okay, oh, do so, you want to put it... Um, go on, get, take the, the time, get it in the, the background. Yep. Apologies, apologies. That's all right. Um, um, I'll just I, his, what, I was going to put in hectic cheese in, in Google, but then I realised that's actually not his real name. He has become a, more or less, not, not just a meme, but... but a, Oh, for fuck's sake. Well, there's most of him. <laughs> but he is a Melbourne Storm player. Uh, and I think, was it, was it Joey that coined the term? Yeah, I think it was Joey that said he looks like a block of cheese. Okay. So he looks like a block of cheese. He's a very uh, thick man, I think would be the best way to... Very thick. Very yeah. thick. Chode is another description. Chode, chode is also a, it could work. I'm surprised Joey didn't call him a chode. It sounds like something he would call him. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. That's a Joey phrase. Absolutely. He's loosen up. I mean, Joe, it's, but in saying that, Joey is a bit, I mean, I'm not going to say stumpy, but he's getting close. How do you mean stumpy? Oh, by, as, as in size wise. Yes. Yeah. 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 There he is. Okay. So that's the cheese. That's the cheese. And so he's, he's essentially, he's small of stature, but very thick. Let's just <laughs> put it that way. Um, he got termed that. And then I just put up a meme saying, like, because he'd put, he'd, you know, you watch interviews and you can tell someone has a bit of character. They're a bit different. They, they're on a different like kind of plane. And yeah, and I just said, I wonder what the cheese is. I wonder what the cheese is up to now. It's probably something hectic. And then that just went pfft, like everyone just like, just kept, you know, what's the cheese up to? Probably something hectic. And then people were just like spamming under his photos. Hectic, hectic. That's hectic. Wow. That's hectic. Um, like every post he put up, there'd be like frigging a hundred comments of folks going, whoa, that's hectic. And it would be like just a picture of him standing there. So why doesn't um, he anyways, have merch? Exactly. Like the, like the club hasn't done any merch. Um, you know, for, ex- for example, I had Josh had a car like, uh, like, I think, I don't know whether I reached out to him or he reached out to me. I don't know. But anyway, I, I just said like, let's, let's do um, like the six boodoos for your ass. That's um, also a viral thing. So basically he got Budweiser uh, beer and on the front of it actually says boodoo, which is dick in indigenous. Right. And he just said, and he just like went like that like that. And he said, six boodoos for your ass, like a six pack or whatever. And that went viral. And so now we're going to put shirts together that say six boodoos for your ass. And like, like people want to wear that. Like I'd wear a cheese shirt, like, or, or for example, why haven't they had games called blocks of cheese that you can buy and put on your head? On your head. Absolutely. And this you know, is where like, the marketing people, they lose out because you have, and I, I know this uh, through a particular family member who was involved with the Knights uh, in management. And I won't say who that is, but you can probably yep. guess. And people who do the marketing, do they just have no idea? They've come out of uni, yep. they're doing it by the book, and that is not how people become sex- successful in marketing. You have to have a, an outlandish mindset. And it's the same with the whole Conor McGregor thing. He sells himself. Like, why is there no front rower in the game of rugby league today who was calling out someone from the opposition? So I'm going to take yeah, your I'll... fucking head off. I'll... Why wouldn't you do that? You immediately increase your value. I'm with you, but mate. Oh, absolutely. I think there was some comments. I think um, during Origin, and it's, it seems like Origin that they, they like let slip sometimes, and they'll say it. But like someone said something like, "I'm going to kill them" or something like that. Um, and yeah. and it went wild. Everyone loved it. Everyone yes. fucking loved it. You know, because the, they want to see that. That's what people want to see. This is fucking oath. 
every single contact sport, whether it is MMA, whether it's boxing, whether it's rugby league, um, it is all about that gladiatorial mindset. You want to see these people and they are paid good money to go in and have brain damage. That's what it is all about. <laughs> that is what people want to see. They want them smacking oh, heads absolutely. against each other. And I know people talk about you've got to worry about concussions and I talk about that too. That is a big concern for a lot of people. But when you sign up to play, you need to be aware that that is a possibility. And I know that for me, when I was playing, all I wanted to do was go and take other people out. I just wanted to hurt mm. people. That was it. Yep. You know? yep. I wanted to win and try and hurt someone. Yep. That's just the way oh, it absolutely. is. Mate, but, I'm totally with you. Totally with you. And for whatever reason now, you just can't have that attitude. It's like, oh, yeah, we just go out there. We work in the ruck. We, we, you know, we slow it down. It's a 12-second play of the ball. We're all mates afterwards. We're all slapping up and kissing each other afterwards and, and saying prayers. No. No. Go out there and try and kill someone. <laughs> That's what we want. Well, you know, the, the irony is, is that in the changing room, that's what they're saying to each other. Um, it, so, so I, I lost. I lost my train of thought too. I was mesmerised by wood. The wood um, is back. Yeah, you just you just out of the grave come on your screen. Petrif- um, I hope he didn't come on my screen. Petrified. <laughs> He's come on your screen. Um, but yeah, no. The, the irony is, is that it's like this. This we don't speak about it. Like you know what I mean. Like it's in the changing room. We're saying, cunt. When he gets the ball, fucking rip his head off. That's yeah. what's actually, that's the exact, that's not even, that's, I'm not exaggerating when I say that is what is being said. Yep. It is actually like, mate, if he gets the fucking ball, I want you to shoot out a line and fucking drive him into the ground. And yet we're not allowed to say that publicly. And it's like, well, first of all, after the game, even if, if even, even if I said, mate, I'm trying to fucking shot my, I would never shot anyone. I'm a fucking small little piss weak winger. But like, let's say I was saying that before the game. After the game, I don't still hate the guy. Like no. it's like it, it's not like I hate him. It's it's a, actually a respect thing of like we're going to war against each other. It's like the the obviously I'm not comparing um, shit chat to, to the hucker, but that's a sign of respect them them giving you the hucker. You know what I mean? It's 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 a war challenge, um, and it's a similar to again I'm not conflating the two. I'm not saying they're even, but I am saying is, is like if I'm saying I'm going out to kill you, that's a sign of saying I respect you enough that I I want to go hard at you, and you better be going hard at me because I want to see who the best is. Um, it is. So it's respect for the game as well. It's like, yeah. okay, this is what we have decided to come here on this field today to do. I'm a, I'm a front rower or I'm a lock or I'm a second rower. And it is, it's something that my old man always talks about and always did talk about was he wanted to put as much fear as possible into his opposite number. You have to beat yep. your opposite number. Absolutely. You have to be looking for him. As soon, as soon as the kickoff happens, if he's taking the first hit up, you want to be flying out of the line and trying to jam him. And I, I don't think we see that much of that anymore. I mean, there's one guy who my favorite player is Mitch Barnett from the Knights because he mm. is, and when I go to games, he's always flying out of the line trying to jam cuts. Yeah. And I fucking love that. That is like, I love, you know, I love Josh Adokar because he's high flyer. He's quick as, unbelievable athlete. But to see someone fly out of the line and trying to damage someone, I just, yeah. that's my favorite thing in the world. You know, that is yeah, my favorite absolutely. thing. That and trying to get the heavies on each other. Because I, so I signed up with a membership with the Knights this year and they sent out an email a couple of weeks ago because of Corona, everything's fucked. You know, you've lost your money. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but he, fuck yourself. He's, yeah, fucking sorry guys, we've already spent it. Um, he's uh, Kayo, the, or Kogo, whatever it's fucking called, the app that like Netflix yeah, Kayo, is sport. Yeah. yeah, Kayo. Owned by Fox Sports. Oh, right. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So they've got some of the classic matches on there. And I've been watching those recently, man, even the, you know, from the early two thousands back to the nineties that I feel like it's not a better game because the athletes aren't as good. I think it is a better game because it's more free flowing. You watch the yeah, play, the balls, agree. it's a, you get tackled around the legs, one up top, it's straight up rather than, caught up, you know, front rower hits the other front rower, then someone else goes around the leg, someone around the midsection, and it's a slow 12-second play of the ball rather than back in the 90s where it's hit, down, up, come on, let's jam this other cunt um, yep. and go in. Now, there are a lot of people who love modern rugby league, and I do love modern rugby league, but I feel like I enjoy those games more. And I don't 100% know why that is, but I just enjoy them more. And I think that's why I've sort of gone further to... 
other sports like I like MMA, uh, watching the UFC, I enjoy that more because I have more of a, an investment in the characters there. And you'd be different because you're a you're a rugby league. You you're mad for it, you know. And you talk to all the players and all that type of stuff. But for some reason, I always head to the UFC when I really want to watch something that I enjoy. And I know the people who are fighting and I know their, their backgrounds and I've heard them talk and I've heard them talk openly about things. I might've heard them on a podcast and gotten to know them a little bit more. And then I, you know, people like Volkanovsky or, or even um, Robert Whittaker, you know, people who I've spoken to Volkanovsky, not so much, but Whittaker, I did podcasts with him. Um, and By the way, if you want to speak to Volk, so I can set that up. I'll set yeah, that up. We, we have one planned. And then okay. this whole yeah. okay. shit, so, shit happened, and, and he's okay. a very so, nice, very nice guy. Uh, Volkanovski, yeah. he 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 helped me out. Just said, yeah, let's do it. Whenever, whenever, we'll make it yeah. work. Legend. Very, he's very, the world very... champ. How crazy is it? Like he's the world champ. Amazing. And he's like, yeah, sweet, whatever. Yeah, legend. As I said, I said, mate, making front rowers proud all over the globe. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what I think it is, mate. I think it, the reason why the UFC, I love UFC as well. The reason why I think it does so well and it is so great. It's because it's the purest form of sport in the sense yeah. it's so extreme that there is like, there is rules, but the rules are to accentuate the violence. They're not to take away from it. And I think the problem with like, if there is a problem with modern rugby league and it's one of the, the worst things to happen to the game is the wrestle. The yeah. wrestle has changed everything. And that takes away from the context because people aren't watching footy to see who's got the fucking best jujitsu leg hold or see who can get underhooks in or tackled. Because most people watching footy don't even know what's happening in the tackle. All they can see is a dude on the ground and he's not getting up. And it's like, fuck me dead. Um, so I, I totally agree. I think the reason why old school footy is so good to watch, could you imagine the athletes of today oh. in that generation? Like, is in, like I, the thing is, like, I'm not saying that the generation of that time couldn't play today because of all science and everything. Like, they would be maybe just as good. Um, there wasn't as big a pool they were pulling from. But what I am saying is, is like the, the type of footy played back then, could you imagine if you could bring it in today's game and get rid of the wrestle? It would be so exciting. It would be, it, it, honestly, I, that would be the one thing that I think could make us really challenge AFL and maybe even overtake it if we had that free-flowing, exciting footy again. Yeah, you change that, that play the ball from a 10 second play of the ball every couple of tackles to, you know, that two, three second hit. And also, I don't know if this, I'm just thinking this on the fly, but maybe players are getting too fatigued from that wrestle as well. Because as someone from my point of view has done jujitsu, it is very hard to do. And I imagine, you know, moving up and down off a line in defense and then throwing jujitsu in on top of that, that's got to really drain the gas tank to the point where, okay, maybe you can't run that extra 10%, that, that harder, that extra 10%, or you can't make that pass, or you can't get to the ball on this occasion. And maybe that's taking a lot away from it. Or maybe it's the opposite because you're waiting and you're having a rest. I'm not too sure. No, no, you, you're totally right because the, the, some of the hardest cardio is wrestle cardio. So, for example, if I'm getting tackled and I don't fight to get up, they can hold me down even longer because, because, the, because they've got holes that the refs don't understand it looks like it's just like nothing's happening. Therefore, whereas if I'm fighting to get up and like thrashing about and ripping out an arm or, or whatever, it actually, it's, it makes them get up quicker because it can see that like I'm trying to get up. And so the problem with that is, is wrestle cardio is essentially anaerobic cardio. So every time, not only are you doing the, the, the 10 second burst into the line, you're doing another 10 second burst to try to, because as you know with jujitsu or, or more with wrestling, but you've got to explode to get out of certain things. Like sure. you can't just like, you know, especially with wrestling specifically, explode to get out um, and up. Um, and so, I mean, I'm totally with you. It does fatigue you, especially the attacking player. It, it doesn't fatigue the defending player as much because you've got the underhawks, you've got other people with, with their legs. It's actually the attacking player that fatigues more. Um, so, mate, you've got, absolutely got a point. Absolutely got a point. Yeah, I, 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 I don't see how they can come back from that, unfortunately. But I would yeah, love no, to see fuck. a more... Uh, free-flowing game and I, I think it would really as you said change change the scope of things but on to on to MMA, MMA for a moment uh, John Jones this week uh, unfortunately uh, in, a, in a in a situation with the police over there in uh, Albuquerque I believe and pulled out of a car with uh, with with a weapon uh, intoxicated intoxicated and asked to do the old uh, one step in front of the other and failed that and now he's got a um, a whole nother case on his hand that he's got to have to worry about. Um, 
how, how does that affect someone like, you know, who, well, I mean, I know how it affects me, but how do you feel about that whole situation where you see someone, I, I really enjoy watching John Jones fight. He's obviously an amazing fighter, arguably one of the best fighters in history, but to see him continually just do these things where you think, are you fucking serious, mate? Like, how does he not have a driver? How doesn't he have someone looking after him? Like, there should be an employee there that, that he just says, you know, mate, take me out, make sure everything's okay. And, and yet he's, here he is getting pulled over, getting breathalyzed and blown over. Mate, it, um, it almost like, again, like, it's, it's obviously, I'm sure there's more to it, all that carry on. But almost as a former professional athlete, it makes me kind of dislike him in the sense that, like, I have a bitterness towards him. Like the first time it was disappointment. The second time it was okay. All right. He's young. And then the third time it's like, mate, pull your fucking head in. And now it's to the point where it's like, mate, how dare you disrespect the sport like that? How dare you disrespect every, every fan you've ever had? How dare you disrespect all the young men coming up in the sport that um, looked up to you? It, It gets to the point where, you know, I understand some athletes try to say, I don't owe anyone anything, but I'm sorry. Like, yeah, maybe for the first two times you can kind of say that like, yeah, cause you're a human being. So it kind of gives you that leeway of like, yeah, yeah, you fuck up, fuck up, fuck up. But when you get to the point where it's like the six fuck up or, or however many it is, it's like, no, actually you do owe the fucking fan something because they took you back. They paid for your fucking main events. They paid for your merchandise. They kept supporting you through all that bullshit. So you actually do owe the fans cunt and you're still doing what you're doing. Um, it just shows a sign of who he is as a person. He's clearly, he's just, he doesn't have the same, um, he, he is not what, the, the, the problem with John Jones is, is that he's the greatest mixed martial artist that isn't what mixed martial arts is about. Mixed martial arts is about self-discipline, self-control. It's about a way of life. It's about, it's not about trying to hurt someone else. It's actually about all of those things, in my opinion. So that's why John St. Pierre is the greatest, greatest of all time. Because he, ingr- he embraced all of mixed martial arts from the, defeating someone to outside the ring about being an example about um a discipline in life that can guide you in a way that i mean because that's the underrated thing about mixed martial arts it gives strength to a lot of young men and women um that may not have had strength um and so that's what pisses me off about john jones is that he disrespects the sport he disrespects his fans unbelievably like they spend their hard-earned cash they go to work every week they got no fucking money as it is they're spending 60 bucks on a pay-per-view to watch him fight um and yet he does that to them so yeah mate i just i got no time for it like there was a time probably like two fuck ups ago where i was like look maybe you could still consider him the goat i I think that this completely rules him out like he is not even in the conversation anymore with the with the whole picogram situation with the uh steroids (laughs) and all that type of stuff i think you can let that go that was that was whatever but this is yeah. just like, it's it's almost like, you, you know, your mate who continually gets arrested or does DUIs or, you know, breaks up with his missus and then they blew and they get back together. Oh, you just go, are you fucking, like, do you have the same brain as me? I, I yeah. often look at people and go, what type of brain do you have? Because I, I think about it with some of the blokes I used to play footy with and I go, what do I, I know what I think about when I'm at home by myself, like, you know, things that run through my head. I think about weird things like the universe and shit. Like, but what do you yep. think about? Like, what happens <laughs> yeah. in your mind? Like, are you just, like, thinking about brick yep. walls and shit like that? Like, I don't understand what would go through someone's head. And what decision... Like, obviously, he's got a problem with alcohol. Obviously, he's got a problem with drugs. I wouldn't be surprised if he's got a, a problem with uh, mood disorders or anxiety and things like that. Like, I think that, as, as someone who has anxiety problems, I think a lot of people try and fix that with alcohol because it is an anti-anxiolytic um, and, and you know, nothing, nothing wrong with alcohol. We all enjoy beers and, and uh, bloke in a bar beer, bloke beer. Uh, <laughs> shout out. Not that I have any. <laughs> uh, fucking sold out. Um, I was actually going to drink. Know, a mate, we'll get you some. We'll get you some. Don't worry. <laughs> I was we'll going to drink some. a beer while we had this. And I thought, Oh, fucking better. Not that's against brand, but um, no, no, you can it, fucking drink it. Whatever beer you want. You know what? You know, what's weird. It's like for, for like, a lot of brands get caught up in the business side of things. Sorry to fucking ruin your train of thought, but we fucking, I'm Aussie too. And so Forex VB in that, that's part of my culture. So fucking, if you want a Forex and VB, fucking oath, like I want a fucking Forex and VB. Like, like we love Australia and that's part of Australia. So fuck you if you don't like that. You know what I mean? That's the way I feel anyway. Man, I, I mean, I stopped a lot of drinking and I stopped a lot of that when I stopped playing footy and, and I had a lot of good years of, you know, carrying on like a 
fucking pork chop and all that type of stuff. And it's made me enjoy, you know, the piss more now that I do it less. But it came to the point where I had to sort of drag it back so I could go and do shows and all that shit. But I'd so I could live like a human being. <laughs> so I could actually wake up to myself and grow up. But those <laughs> years you have from like when you're 17, 18, onwards to like 20 if you know if you know you know if you're 30 and you're still bending every weekend like you know as long as you got your life sorted out good on you but um you're a better man I, than me that's for sure i can't do it yeah. i used to be able to do it i used to be i pride myself on a good old-fashioned bender i can't I've, i'm the biggest pussy i can't i can i can yeah. you know once again it's like four o'clock i'm like right going home goodbye and that's see the, you later avo, that's the avo for me four o'clock in the avo for me <laughs> i'm done but I, I remember when I was, you know, 18 and getting introduced to that sort of, because I, you know, I went from playing in like a feeder club uh, in Newcastle to the local pub comp. And I started playing there at Dudley. And I remember the first Mad Monday we had. And one of the boys turned up with fucking um, like a hundred bag of pingers. And I've never seen drugs before. And this dude's got like a bag that you'd see in a fucking, in a drug bust on in one of the airport the shows. Yeah. You'd see it in like, you know, it's almost like Scarface shit. And I'm like, he's yep. got a hundred pills there. Are you fucking serious? And the boy, it, you know, after a day, they're all gone. Like, you know, you know what I mean? But just eating them. Just yeah, I'm taking them like vitamins. But that <laughs> is something that a lot of people, you know, just they get exposed to. And I think it's the same with people like John Joan. Who is he around? Like, mm. is he still around? Like, he's. I saw this, and I don't want to speak how to turn, but I will. Uh, Cade, <laughs> I don't want to, but I'll do it. I'll do it. When when Cade Snowden came from the Sharks and he was playing New, for New South Wales and for Australia at the time, he got signed by the Knights, and it was a big deal. And I was working at a local pub that he drank at when he was younger, and he lived lived just nearby, and he was up there all the time on the piss. And I don't know if there's other things going on in his life, but dead set coming home to where all his dickhead mates were was the worst thing that ever happened to him. Yeah. I mean, it, yep. it's, it's the same for Jones. You know, he's in Albuquerque mm. around all his friends. Sometimes when you take away from all your mates, you actually become a, a better person and it sucks socially, but you're able to make yourself, you know, you just get out of that rhythm. I think that's, mm. you know, out of your comfort zone perhaps. Absolutely. And like, it's, it's just so easy to, if you don't have your mates around, you don't have like going and drinking, drinking. I mean, if you're drinking cause you're depressed and obviously you'll drink by yourself, but like drinking by yourself isn't the most enjoyable thing. Like having a few is good, but yeah, if your mates are around, it's an easy distraction. Like your mate gives you a text. Oh mate, come on, like come out. And you're like, all right. And before you know it, you're fucking rocking up with a hundred pingers on a mad Monday. <laughs> You've, all, of a, all of a sudden you've signed in, signed up in March and then six months later you're still playing. But it, it's like that. I mean, you know, you get your mates pulling your arm, twisting your arm sort of thing and you get out and get amongst it. But I don't so know. Who's I, your I, goat MMA? Who's your goat MMA? The greatest all-time MMA. Um, I, I, I got into the sport four years ago because of Conor McGregor. I'm not saying he's the goat. I'm just saying mm. that he got me into the sport. I unfortunately missed, and I've seen it now through Fight Pass and stuff, but I missed a yep. lot of uh, GSP. Um, in fact, I think the only fight I saw was his Bisping fight, Bisping fight uh, that was live anyway. I've, I've, as I said, I've watched the other ones. But as far as the GOAT is concerned, I mean, I have a lot of GOAT fights, like things like... Um, the Holly Holm and Misha Tate fight where, he, where Holly Holm choked Misha... No, sorry, where Misha, cho Misha Tate choked out Holly Holm in the last round. That was insane. Yep. That was um, insane. As far as a... Fuck, you've really put me on the spot here, motherfucker. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, mean, I assume, like, being a more recent fan, I'm about six years, so I'm not some fucking, you know, old veteran or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I'd assume someone like Max Holloway before he got beaten or Khabib Nurmagomedov or even uh, DC could be considered a GOAT in my opinion. Well, I mean, there's um, Anderson Silva as well. I mean, we saw the not so much the end of him, but the the the, the downward spiral. Well, not downward spiral, but just the downwards uh, trajectory of his career. Um, Adesanya looks amazing. Uh, yeah, he could he be something really, really special. I mean, who knows what's going to happen there? Um, you know... 
But also in saying that, when he beat Rob Whitaker, Rob fought a very different fight to what he normally fights. And, you know, I think Rob will come back bigger and better. Um, Volkanovski. Yeah, that, that Rob, that sorry, Rob fight was... Um, oh, that, I was just going to say that Rob fight, like, I'm sh- look, I'm some fucking fuck with the big nose on the internet, so I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. But I just was so surprised that he was standing at kickboxing range and engaging like that. And again, like, I, I'm some fuck with on the internet so whatever but that's that's adesanya's game like i was i thought we were going to see a lot of like dirty boxing clinch rest try to take down come back out and yep. so i mean because i'm a huge Whitaker fan like he was one of my he's you know one of my favorite fighters still is one of my favorite fighters i love he represents what mma is all about um i was just so surprised that he i just think that he again it's easy to say this but maybe he got too caught up in it maybe he really just wanted that knockout um and i just was like i couldn't I can understand if he was standing at boxing range with Adesanya. It's still pretty dangerous because he's a fucking great striker. But yeah, I was I was really surprised at the way he approached that fight. So I I, I agree with you in the sense that this is no, that's no knock on Rob. That's saying that I really do think the rematch would go much differently, hmm. um, and I do think he can come back from this. And you're not the first person to suggest that either. A lot of people have said that. Even my coach, my my MMA coach, uh, Paul Daniel. He's uh, obviously he, you know to be a coach, you have to be very invested in the sport. But he's been around it since he was six years old, sort of thing. You know, he loves uh, the sport of mixed martial arts and every martial art surrounding it. And he said the exact same thing. He said, "Man, he led that fight like he was angry. Mm. You know, he he yep. fought it like he was angry, which is not Rob's." Uh, well, what, as you said, what the fuck do I know? But it's not Rob's game, sort of thing. Yeah, um, it's so hard. Like, it's so hard to, you know, it's feel like I feel like at the start of every episode of everything, you need to say like, I'm, wi- hey, I'm willing to I have my mind changed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm willing to have my mind changed. I'm not going to the fucking grave with this. Like, it's just an opinion. I'm probably totally wrong. You know what I mean? At the start of every fucking yeah. episode, you just have like a list of shit so that people understand. Like, guys, I'm not dying on this hill. Like, it's just I'm just chatting. Well, that's what I can always fall back on because of stand-up. I can say, hey, I'm a comedian. I was just joking, man. It's all good, you know. But, <laughs> but yeah, you as- signed it on a legal document. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. as, far as, as far as a goat is concerned, that is a hard answer. I, man, I love McGregor. And I know a lot of people are saying, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. If you follow the support, you love McGregor. I just like who he is. I like that whole thing. That's, that's my sort of... Um, how much did the pub punch hurt you? How much did that... Because I was the same. And that, for me, took like... I could cop the Khabib thing. Um, I could cop all the other stuff. But as soon as I saw that, I was like, I, I'm still a huge fan. I was still really nervous when he came back to fight Cerrone. And, and I, I, again, I'm still a huge fan, but he wasn't, he was no longer, he was no longer the Conor McGregor that I knew. And, he, and I don't think he could ever be that again. Because like, for me personally, I don't care how far south you go. I understand fame gets us to us all. I understand like trust me i've like obviously not been in his shoes but with footy even when i was young i be, i could be a dickhead sometimes because i was so ar- you know it gets to your head it, it, i yeah. get all that but to go so far south to punch an old guy i don't care if he said fuck mate i fucking fingered your missus out the back i don't care what he said to punch an old dude like that for me i was like mate fuck me like it is and, and it, it does say something about how blind i am with um with love and admiration if you will because i looked at that and i was just like didn't see it didn't say what punch, what are you talking <laughs> what <happened>? about? <laughs> but you know, you know, the thing is, don't get me wrong, I'm also of the mind everyone deserves a second chance if they're shown that they've renet like gotten better. So so like let's say for the next year we see no more controversies, I'm willing to go, you know what, like fuck, you know what, he fucked up, it's whatever. But it definitely stung me a bit, a bit to watch it. It stung me because I cared. It stung me because I was he was the first athlete in a very long time where I was emotionally invested yeah. in the outcome of his fights. Man, that Cerrone fight, I was a nervous wreck all day. Like I couldn't, man, some of those, some of the UFC fights, I can't go and watch at pubs and that because I'm too, I have to be home listening to the commentary. I can't be yeah. doing anything else. I have to be there. And I'm not like that with anything else. It's literally Neither. just Neither. that. Um, yep. and, and Origin and things like that. Like I like, you know, I'm a certain weird way about that as well. But yeah, I, I, I understand where you're coming from with that. And I, I completely agree. But also, you know, rugby league fighters, rugby league players and fighters have a lot in common. A lot of them are psychos and there is a reason that they're in that sport, uh, combat sport. You know, they don't, they're not, they don't have the same wiring as you or I. 
you know absolutely and, that's, and a, that's, a, that's a really good point that gets overlooked a, a lot i reckon is the fact yeah. that we need to remember it doesn't excuse what they do it's not sitting there saying no. oh fuck they can do whatever they want but when crazy shit happens remember these are wild men they're wild animals crazy. they're, they're yes. locked in a cage they're gonna do crazy things and if they're doing crazy things in a cage you know McGregor knocking Aldo out in six seconds, then you know what? He might just throw a punch at an 80-year-old man in a pub. These things happen. This <laughs> happen, can be. <laughs> Fucking hell. You can't, if you can't punch an old bloke in a bar, what is this world What can you to? do? What's wrong with the world? <laughs> <laughs> so what's happening? What's happening bloke in a bar-wise? What's, what's news? Mate, it's, it's all just about... To, we've, we're essentially, from a business perspective, without you know, going too far into the detail of, of where we're at, but we're actually struggling to keep up with demand cash flow wise so for example you know when you sell so much like let's say you sell fucking heaps the money it's not it doesn't appear in your account straight away and the problem is is when you're selling so quickly so for example we're, we're selling so much that like people may think oh they're selling out because they're only putting five cases in a bottle shop and they're trying to create the uh illusion oh, yep. yeah yeah we're putting 60, 70 cases in bottle shops and they're going within an hour. That's sick. Um, and so, it's, mate, as I said, it is the most humbling thing in my life. Like it's, fuck, like I can't put into words. How do you say thank you when you know that that's not, that's not the depth of your feelings? You can't, you just can't. So you've just got to around, go around, fuck every bloke that you see that buys a beer pretty much. Perfect. But other than that, that's, that's a good way to say thank you, surely. I hear. That's what I do after my show. It's just <laughs> hand jobs <laughs> Um, but yeah, so we're at the, from a, a business perspective, it's just about like, it's making sure we stay in stock, which is really hard because what, like, for example, we, we, we've sold out of brews that don't even exist yet. So like bottle O's have said, like, have, well, they've said like, we, we want X amount of cases and we've said, we, we don't have any, we have, we're waiting on a brew to be done. And so before that brew even is in the, the, the vat and in, in, in storage, it's already been sold. So as soon as it gets put in storage, boom, it goes straight out to the bottle shop. But as soon as it gets into the bottle shop, it gets bought out immediately. And so you see what I'm saying when it means like, even though we have like a year's worth of stock initially, now we're in this vicious cycle of chasing our tail, like in the sense that, you know, it takes two weeks to brew. Mm. And so it's just a matter of like trying to stay on top of it. But um, it's incredibly, you know, this isn't me complaining. This is explaining it's a good you know, problem. Kind of how it works. It's a good problem Absolutely. to have. Absolutely. Absolutely. You have people pre-ordering the product? As in like people, like people online or? Yeah. Uh, well, not really because we don't sell online and also we have to sell online through a retailer. Um, right. Okay. But yeah, yeah. So they can't really pre-order it, but we have bottlers in that pre-ordering in the sense that like they're buying shit before it exists kind of thing, kind of like a, you know, you can pre-order a comedy special or whatever. So you put the money, you say we want to purchase it or whatever. Then when it comes out, boom, obviously it comes to you. Um, but yeah, from a perspective, that's a beer perspective. From a sports perspective, we just want to continue growing in the sense that, um, you know, long-term we want to be a, an online competitor to Fox Sports. Like we want to be considered that. I know it sounds mental. I know people, most people when they hear that, they think, holy shit, but you know, for example, our Instagram um, TV, like, you know, this exact same topic, Fox Sports show or Channel 9 show with like, you know, immortals and, and people calling in and then me on the mic, just me in a room, our Instagram gets the same views sometimes more than their Instagram, um, which shows that, you know, yes, obviously I understand there's a whole component of, you know, TV in that. I'm, I'm not discounting that. But what I'm saying is, is that we're already there or thereabouts online. Um, so... Yeah, the long-term plan is basically if you get sports content or footy content initially in Australia, you get it from Bloke in a Bar. That's, that's the, um, the long-term goal. Excellent. And I, I mean, I love that attitude because it is true. Even with people like myself, who I, I looked the other day at the numbers on the free-to-air TV ratings. And there was like, I uploaded four videos that week and three of them were in the top three or, or something like that, really high in those ratings. And these are, these are television stations with you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars getting pumped through them every single day. And I'm just in my studio. You know? mm -hmm. And, and this, is, yeah. this, is, this is the world of the internet. We have more viewers, more eyes than the networks. And we're getting to mm -hmm. that point. And it will happen. And the people who are working the hardest right now will be the ones at the forefront come the future. And I think that's such a positive thing, particularly now when you've got, there's talk of the NRL opening back up, you know, uh, in a couple of months, 
you know, people like yourself, the more content you put out, the better it'll be. And for me, people that are at home, they're sick of hearing shit on the news. They're anxious. They're scared. Some people are depressed. Uh, yeah. If they can watch a video of mine for 10 minutes and they laugh, they're happy and they forget it, about their problems, then I've done my job. I mean, you, what I do, and this is what I try and do with everything I do, and you came to my show in the Gold Coast, and thank you very much for coming, was yeah. I take those people in that room, the millions of people in that room. Yep. And after you've given them hand jobs? After the hand jobs, after I ice <laughs> it up, get me RSI all sorted, I try and make them happy for a, a, a period of time, whether it's an hour, an hour and a half, and they leave their problems at the door. And you do the same thing. You inter entertain people. You give people these great interviews with players and you bring out the best out in, in, in players. You take the media training away. And that's the mm. biggest thing for what you do, I think, is you take that media training that is drilled into players as a part of their contract and, and being brought through clubs. And you allow them to be the people they are. You allow them to be the characters they are. And with things like what you're doing right now, you will help find that Conor McGregor, that front rower that's calling out the opposite front rower. And I think that will be only beneficial to you and the game. Yeah, oh, mate, I, I totally agree. I think, um, and just quickly, for everyone listening, I, as a fellow content creator, um, you know, obviously way smaller stature than yourself, but you often have a, I'm sure you're similar, like you have a higher standard when you go to watch someone else's show or just because... It's kind of like if you're an NRL player, you have a higher standard in watching people play footy or whatever. Sure. So everyone listening, I, I was going in going, I wonder how it's going to be the show. Mate, I was fucking genuinely impressed and left really? your show going, fuck. Uh, mate, absolutely. I, I told the boys that. I said, mate, honestly, coming here, I wasn't sure how high the quality would be, but I honestly felt like I was at a genuine special, like a comedy special. And the stand, like, in, like obviously, it's a genuine one. But the standard, in my opinion, was an international standard. Like I didn't go to that show and feel like, oh, I'm just at some Australian show. It felt like I was at uh, a world-class um, comedian special. So, mate, it was fantastic. So Thank you. anyone that Thank does you. well, go and watch it. Um, but what I, you know what I love about the fact that the internet exists is that the, like, the reason someone is successful on the internet is because they offer quality. Sometimes with shows and that, because they have a monopoly on attention or they used to people sometimes get put in positions and they get these positions. Um, now I'm no conspiracy theorist or whatever, but what I'm saying is, is that a lot of the time it's not earned what they've got. It's because someone above them wanted them as a host, someone, you know, they knew this oh, or knew that. hundred percent. The internet, the internet is, is beautiful because you are there purely from talent. That's it. There's no, there's no uh, financial push. There's no um, someone giving you a leg up. There's no connections that got you even got you the initial job just to be a part of the company. You're um, chosen. No... You're, the people have spoken. They want you. That's yeah, what they exactly. want. Yeah. You know, you look mate, at the TV and, so... and you know, this person is giving you the news. This person is the one hosting this TV show. You didn't choose those, choose those people. You didn't ask no. for this commentator. But you, you want that podcast. You want to watch that show. You want to watch that, uh, that YouTube clip because you decide to. And that's why people actually genuinely give a shit. Look at YouTube. Mm. Look at David Dobrik. People go fucking mental over him. It's the mm. same thing as Justin Bieber 10 years ago. People went yep. mad over him. Same thing with Post Malone. He had his break on, on YouTube. This is yep. the biggest platform that we have, Facebook, YouTube. I think YouTube is more important than any of the other ones. Um, yep. I'm not sure if it's the same for, for what you do, but for me particularly, um, but it's just so vital for people to have that choice and people have never had it before. You were given the media. Now you get to take what you want. And I think that's just so, it's so good. It's so good for Mate. people, not only just us, but for people who are watching. Oh, absolutely. Like the, the content that you have access to now for free is um, it's incredible. And I, and I just think that, also, I just love the fact that the gatekeepers no longer exist. Now, the gatekeepers exist still in a sense where a lot of advertising dollars, I think it's some crazy amount, like 85% of advertising is still on TV. And it's like, yeah. you know, in comparison, it's like 4% online or whatever. But as the advertised, advertiser dollars change, the, it'll just, ex, like the internet will just explode even further. Like uh, some people are like, oh, is it too late to get into or whatever? So if there's anyone that wants to create content, obviously, you know, you've got to be good at what you do, but but they're worried that, oh, it's too late. Imagine, imagine being in the first four years or five years of television and saying it's too late. 
You know what I mean? And that's where we are with the internet and YouTube. We're in the first five, six, seven years. We've still got another 50, 60 years until the next whatever yeah. breakthrough comes through. Absolutely. Um, so th there's just so much time to get into it. Just start something small um, because you just fucking never know. You just, you never, and you know what else it is? It's a, it's a fantastic creative outlet for a lot of people that don't know they're creative or they don't actually, because they've kind of come up through a school system that doesn't encourage it. They haven't been told by their friends they're creative. But sometimes you feel like, oh, I'm, I'm missing something in my life. Like something's missing and they're just doing their nine to five job or whatever. It's actually a really good way. Even if fucking one person's watches, it's actually just, just to get it out of you. Just whatever it is, just to create something. Yeah. Um, it's, it's similar to like a lot of blokes, like they love just building things. There's also a lot of people that love to just create something. Whatever, whatever it is, it's con creating content is the same as creating or building a fucking house or whatever. It's just a different... You know, it's a mental creation kind of thing rather than a physical recreation. So, yeah. Well, I'm fucking when I started, when I started YouTube and I, I, the reason that I, one of the things that I love is when I hear people say what you said about you enjoyed my show and you enjoyed mm. the, the standard because I started doing stand up about six years ago and I did it for years and I never really got anywhere with it because I'm a white dude who makes horrible mean jokes on stage. So I started making content. And when I started making content, I saw a lot of people that had been there for a long time. They had cemented their, stop, their spot. You were even there. You were already taking off. Bloke in a bar was killing it. And I thought, you know, or maybe it's a bit too late. And I thought, fuck it, I'll give it a go. And I made, man, I made a video or two videos every week for almost a year. And I, I, it took me a year to hit a thousand subscribers of making fuck. two videos a week. People don't see that shit. They, they don't. Like, I, I, I mean, even my, like my partner, like I, I say to her that go to the biggest, like some of the biggest influencers you've got. And let's say they've been going for 10 years. Let's say that, let's just say they have 200,000 followers. We'll just use that number. And then they've been going for 10 years. That's like roughly 800 followers a month on average. Now, if you said to someone, do what you do, and I'm going to give you 800, 800 extra followers a month, they'd be like 800 followers. Fuck that, man. That's going to take forever. But that's the genuine reality of it. Like yourself, it like if you average out your followers, it takes forever. A <laughs> yeah. thousand, a year, and only a thousand followers. So then one video went viral, and then yep. I went from a thousand to 150,000 in a week. Holy sh... What video was it? I've got to see the video that went viral. I'll write that down, actually. So it was a video called uh, 10 Reasons Not to Visit Australia. And now it's got about five. Oh, okay. Yep, yep. Yeah, I know that. So it's got that 6 video. million views on, on YouTube and about seven or eight on Facebook and stuff like that. So it went super viral. And yep. that was great. But then, you know, the next week, it we went back to another video that didn't go viral. And then one video mm. went viral after that. And it's just... it's You can't write a viral video. You just have to be lucky. And, you know, man, ever since then, like now I've upped my game to five pieces of content a week, five YouTube videos a week. And well, I'm doing that because, impressive. well, I'm just trying to get content out there because people, I think people need it at the moment. I think they need, absolutely. you know, if this conversation um, people find entertaining or it takes your mind off whatever you're worrying about or any of those things, then, then fantastic. We've done our job. Yep. Um mm. And I'll just continue to do that. I wanted to get to 100,000 subscribers. I did that. I wanted to get to 500,000. I did that. I wanted to get to a million. And now I want to get to 5 million. That's my next goal. So I'll just continue wig you out growing. A million people? Sorry? Does it ever wig you out? Like a million people? That's ah, like... No, I deserve if... it. <laughs> fair call. That's fair call. You got me there. You got me there. You got me there. But like, that's like 15 ANZ stadiums full. Yeah. Crazy. Crazy. Wow. It makes no sense, you know? Right. And, and even when I go out, and last year I did 80 shows in six different countries. And we did a 2,000, well, I did a 2,000 seat um, uh, theatre in Sydney. 2,000 mm. people there for me. It was insane. And uh, man, so that's a, it's actually coming out soon, the special for that. And it was just, it was so, in, it was just crazy. Because I never thought that I would be um, someone who people, you know, they want to get photos with or they want to, Oh, do all that type of stuff, man. After that show, we had two and a half hours of people lining up to meet me. And that was the most, and, and we're talking hello photo, goodbye. You know, we had to rip yeah. through it. Otherwise the security yeah. were freaking out, but man, it, it's such a, it's such a humbling thing. It's an exciting thing, but also it's a thing that you sometimes you just can't stop and smell the roses. You have to keep working on it yeah. because if you don't, it'll go away. You have Absolutely. to keep going. Absolutely. 
what did you um being like because like you, you played footy and you would know what i'm talking about when you say like getting the confidence to say a i want to be a stand-up comedian b i want to start creating content as an aussie male um especially as an aussie male that isn't you know necessarily feminine and likes all that kind of stuff was that did you ever go through a thing was like oh fuck like the boys will rip me fuck the yeah boys will be, and, fuck and they did me. They did, yeah. but man, I um, you know, what are you doing? You're not funny and all that type of stuff. And and they can all go and suck a dick because go me. Uh, but suck, it, wood, but suck it is. wood dicks. That's big old. Uh, hang on. <laughs> Everyone. And they can down. go and suck a dick. <laughs> Bro, so big, man. He's so He's big. So big. He's a big dude. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, people will always tell you that. They'll always tell you, I oh, shouldn't do this, shouldn't do that. And um, man, I don't speak to too many of my mates from back in that time. I'm just not not many, you know. Uh, I'm not. I don't not like them. I just I'm busy, you know. I'm always yeah. away or uh, always working or whatever, and and that's just the way that that life sometimes works. But you have to just not give a fuck what other people say. Don't be one of those people that goes, oh, I don't give a fuck. Like when people are trying to pull you up on actual things, don't be a dickhead. Yeah. But if you have a, a dream or something you actually want to do and you figure out a way that you can do it, don't just say you're going to do it. Work out how you're going to do it. And uh, and that's what I did. I mean, I, I started making videos about Newcastle because that's where I'm from. And that was my mm. idea. I'm going to become, uh, I'll, I'll make that social media following in Newcastle first. And that's what I did. Then I made videos about the, the Blues, uh, the New South Wales Blues. And that was my next step was to make it about New South Wales. I made a viral video about that on Facebook. And then it was about Australia. And now it's about spreading out to the world. Um, that was my plan. I followed that and it worked. So, you know, come up with a plan, figure it out. Don't listen to other people if, unless they're trying to help you. And even if they're trying to help you, sometimes you just got to say, shut the fuck up and go with what you think works. Because people, especially if you've never done it before or no one your family's done it before or if, if, or if your family don't know, doesn't know anyone who's done that before, they will always tell you it's a bad idea. Oh, mate, absolutely. And and also a lot of advice you get from people around you is a projection of their limitations. Like they're, they're saying you can't do it, but what they're really saying to you is I can't do it. Like yeah. I don't, I don't have the confidence in myself to do it. So therefore you shouldn't be able to do it. Another thing as well as, and you, and you kind of touched on it is that don't conflate. There's this like whole kind of meme of like, just don't give a fuck, man. Like don't give a fuck. Like don't conflate not giving a fuck with giving a fuck in the sense that for example, me, like, I don't care what people think, but I also really fucking care what people think, you know? So Absolutely. it's about caring what the right people think and yes. targeting what the wrong person, not giving a fuck about them. But, you know, I always say to people that have this like, yeah, man, you just, I just got to give less of a fuck. And it's like, well, hang on a sec. Do you think there's not a single famous person ever that is not given a fuck? Like Steve Jobs gave a fuck. Bill Gates, they give a lot of fucks. Um, Bezos, they care. all give a fuck. You have to fucking care. Absolutely. So, mate, um, I think it's just about identifying the person to give a fuck about and the people not to give a fuck about what they think. And, and I guess also looking in, um, you know, what are they doing? Like, what are they doing? Are they, are they someone that you genuinely would draw inspiration from? For yeah. example, like my dad, he's not, um, you know, into, uh, he's not a high, you know, CEO or whatever, but doesn't mean that I can't draw inspiration from him because he does, he works his fucking ring out and he, you know, he's worked for how many years, never had a day off, all that kind of stuff. So it's about really identifying like who can you draw inspiration from and who's the guy that you know for a fact only works fucking 25 hours a week. You know for a fact that he's got no ambition. He doesn't give a fuck about anything. Like I don't really care what he has to say about working hard or dreams because he has no gauge on what a dream or working hard is. Mate, all the people that told me that I wouldn't be successful are all the people that are still getting pissed every single night at the pub or every second night yeah. at the pub and they're never going to go anywhere. And no. there's the reason that they won't is because they don't care. They don't care enough about your own self-development. They're not listening to, you know, people, interesting podcasts. They're not trying to better themselves. And that's fine if that's the life you want to live, but that wasn't the life that I wanted to live. And all I ever wanted Absolutely. to do was play footy when I was a kid. And when I found out that that dream wouldn't happen because I was a little bit How did you find that out? I was a little bit shit. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you have the perfect physique for a footy player. I know. I know. I was just a bit of a pussy. I don't know, man. I, <laughs> I, um, I think just a lot a, of it, you know. You know what's funny? Of, Sorry to interrupt you. You know what's funny? It's like 
you in Australian culture, you you start, you say you're a little bit of a pussy, but that's compared to psychos. Do you know what I mean? Like you're actually compared to the rest of the world, you're actually a very masculine, not pussy, one little bit. Oh, man, but you're comparing I, yourself to maniacs. I I love playing footy, but but for a lot of I was always compared to my old man because he was yeah. uh, such a great player, and so I was never. Was he going part of the '97 Grand Final? Yeah, he did. Yeah. Was he a bit yeah. Oh shit! Yeah, yeah, man, man, he was. Uh, I actually saw something on Facebook. Someone sent it to me the other day, and they they it was a. I can't remember what the dude's name was, but he said he was an ex NRL player, played in the nineties, and he said he put together a team list of the best players he ever played with. And yep. the last player he listed was his eighteenth man. He said Tony Butterfield is number eighteen because I never played with him. But yep. every game I played against him, he was the most I, I'd never been so fearful of someone. No one's ever scared me as much on, on the park than than this bloke. Because Fuck. dad's mindset was all about just trying to fly out of the line and hurt yep. whoever he could. And that was just his attitude from growing up on the mean streets of Penrith. And um, man, he he just fucking busted his ass, you know. Tough, yep. tough as they come and and um, I actually got to play play with him in uh, probably 2013. We played one game together in the in the pub comp up here yeah, in, in in Newcastle, and and uh, we was there was a blue on the field, and we were in the midst of it. And then uh, he he got a mate, play the like, ball. mate. Talk about father son moment in a blue on a footy field. And I mean, that's not a better fucking. So we like, get we get the hectic. penalty. We be at the penalty. He's the big tough bloke. He's nearly 50 at this stage. He takes the hit up quick. To play the ball. Big cutout ball to me, couple of bit of fast, bit of a goosey, and I score underneath goosey. the sticks, man. Oh. Uh, you couldn't ride a better moment, Campy. Mate, you that's fucking sick. <laughs> oh, that's shit, fucking but... so sick. You know what's that, that older generation is too? It's like I've never heard my dad complain. Like he never yeah. complains about anything. Like yeah. it's it, it's like. He doesn't complain so much. I didn't even know he wasn't complaining. It was like the absence of it. I didn't realize that there was an absence of it, if you know what I mean. That's mm. how much he literally never complains. And it's not until you get older when you realize that your parents were just young people just <laughs> yes. giving it a go. Like you think Swing that you, you think your folks have got it all set out and you know you're gonna get older their age and you're just gonna know what's going on. No, <laughs> they're just doing their best every day. They're just yeah. trying to get by, trying to work yeah. out how to look after a child or a couple of kids. And then that's, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm at that age now where, where kids is sort of a, a conversation that me and Mrs. Butterfield are having. And it's, um, it's scary, you know, it's, it's sort of like, holy shit, bro. You know, like that's, am I ready to bring a child into this world? I can, I look after myself, you know? So, so we got dogs. You know what's hilarious? You know, it's hilarious. is like, you're talking about being mature and being able to take care of kids whilst there's a large black man behind you with a huge <laughs> You know what? I think I'm ready for kid. Uh, me and Luke, <laughs> All right. That'll do us for now. Dan and Cam, thank you very much, sir. The reason I called you at the start, uh, Danan, was when I went up to the Gold Coast. And it's, it's it Dennett, yeah? Dennett. Yeah, yeah, it's Dennett. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The bloke who I was with, he goes, you know, bloke in the bar, Danan Kemp is... Uh, <laughs> and I went, Danan Kemp? Who the fuck is that? No, that's... <laughs> no, not Danan. Um, no, not but- Danan. Uh, let's uh, let's plug absolutely everything you got. What do you got? What can we plug for you? Mate, just at Bloke in a Bar. Um, if you enjoy beer, it's just a crisp, easy, easy drinking beer. Um, if not, I'll go fuck myself. Like, seriously, if you don't enjoy it, fuck me. I'm the fuckweed in this situation. So <laughs> it's a win-win situation, really. Like, if you yeah. don't enjoy it, just say, mate, have a sip of the beer and you can say it out loud. That Denan, that Denan is a real fuckwit and I'm the fuckwit. So, mate, when you, um, get your next, when you get your next delivery of it, let me know. I'll swing you some cash. Mate, I want to taste it. No, uh-huh. how dare you? How dare you even think about that? You will absolutely be getting some beer, no doubt in my mind. Um, well, you know what's funny is that so I sent some to Latrell only because he fucking already had ordered some. Like, it, like he'd been saying to me, mate, send me some, send me some. I've got no beer. I've got, I got four, ca- like four cans of beer. And that's it. I've literally like I don't even have beer, and it's my fucking beer. So that's how fucking mental it's been. Like for example, we we went and did t- taste testings in Townsville before this fucking virus hit the world, and we were actually going to have to go to Clint Gutherson's house and take a case back from him because we had no cases to taste test when we went up to Townsville. We literally messaged him. It's like, hey bro, is it all good if we come grab a case off you? Like Indian giver, worst fucking kind of the world. Give me these cases, then so I got to take it back because um, we got no cases. So. 
yeah, it's been uh, been incredibly humbling, man. Incredibly humbling. But oh, man, uh, I, yeah, I, I hope that this sells out for you. I hope you continue to do that. I hope when this corona is over, I hope you do a live event um, somewhere. I think that'd be sick. Um, maybe even for grand final day, get the get the get the live event happening in front of oh, thousands right. of people that'd be sick i'll come along i'll oh, be there especially mate, guests. that would out. be fucking sick <laughs> how good would that be like a bloke in a bar like because we've already talked about having like little mini festivals have like a portable tv park up get like at the beach or something you could watch the footy we put a fucking sausage chisel on with some why not? beers and that why not yeah, you can oh, be at the back of a pub somewhere but a big big screen up for like an origin or something like that i think i think yeah. people would get around that for sure but anyway see what happens but uh thank you very much Kempi. i appreciate your time brother and uh, yes, good on. That's the end of the show. Um, Boom. Uh, what should I uh, get a <laughs> go and subscribe? Uh, <laughs> Producer Connor's going to edit this and he's going to get the shits of me if I don't say certain things. So go and check out the Clips channel, ladies and gentlemen. If you, have, if you can't digest all of this in one go, head to the Clips channel because that's where you can get all the little uh, bitey bits uh, and get stuck into it. Uh, and I don't know, fucking subscribe or some shit. Just don't be, be a good motherfucker. Peace to the Middle East, be dick stinks. I'll see you all very soon. Toodaloo, au revoir, bye.